Good morning. So how'd you do on the quiz? Did you get them all right? Anybody get 100%? They'll be on the quiz at the uh, church picnic. So uh, we'll run through them again sometime soon. Anyway, good morning and welcome to Emmanuel High Church. I'm so glad you've joined us from wherever you are for a time of worship this morning. Today is Sunday, February 28th, and we're in the second Sunday of Lent. I'd like to give a special welcome to anyone who might be joining us for the first time this morning and a thank you to Sandy B. Lynn for being our liturgist. We will continue to have Lenten Bible study. Um, it meets via Zoom on Wednesdays on this very same Zoom link, our worship Sunday worship link. Um, we will be studying what uh, sacrifice and atonement mean in the season of Lent. Um, there's a scripture reading, a Bible project video, uh, uh, audio explanation, and then we have some discussion questions. So I hope you'll join us at 6.30 on Wednesday evenings for a time of fellowship and Bible study. This morning, our hymns are Holy Ground, All Hail the Power of Jesus' Name, Change My Heart, O God, and the Summons. Our scripture comes from the Old Testament, Genesis chapter 17, verses 1 through 7 and 15 through 16, and the Gospel of Mark chapter 8, verses 27 through 38. And now, just a couple of reminders that your microphones are muted to cut down on confusion. Um, but of course, uh, we still encourage you to participate with your voice throughout the, the service. And um, someplace on your screen, you should find a chat box. And if you'd like to enter any prayer requests there, um, we will um, get them and add them to our prayer list. And now let's move into a time of worship, shall we? Each week, we take a moment just to remind our hearts and minds that even though we're still in our homes, that we're now gathering with the body of Christ and entering onto holy ground. And we do this by placing our right hands on our hearts, as you know, and our left hands on our bellies. All right. Let's now take a deep breath in through our nose, slowly to the count of four. And then we can exhale to the count of more than four. A second breath in, breathing in the presence of God. And then a slow breath out, releasing any stress or anxiety we might feel. And one final breath in, breathing in God's peace. And a final breath out, releasing any leftover anxiety. We remember that no matter where we were just a few minutes ago, that now we're in holy ground and that God is with us, drawing us near to the place where Christ is dwelling. If you have a candle, take a moment and light it as I light the candles on our altar. Let's pray, shall we? Loving God, we have heard your call to follow you. And we are here now. Be present to us this morning, Father. We come to hear your saving word. Come, Lord, come. Amen. Let's join together now and sing our introit, Holy Ground.
Good morning. Please join me in the call to worship. The pathway is just beginning. The pathway. We have encountered the wilderness. Now we are moving rapidly toward Jerusalem. Along the way, we will witness astonishing acts of mercy and justice. Lord, be with us on the journey. Guide, Guide our, our lives and our steps, steps we pray. Amen. Amen. join me in the opening prayer. Lord, Lord of presence and power, be with us on the second step of our Lenten journey to the cross. Help us to make a commitment of our lives, our spirits, our hearts to ministry in your name. Amen. The journey of discipleship is never easy, but you can be assured that you will not be on this journey alone. Place your trust in Jesus. He will always faithfully accompany you. Amen. Our scripture lessons this morning illustrate how different characters have a variety of responses and views to God's faithfulness. Today, the Bible Project teaches us what the Bible means when it says that God is faithful. Let's watch. 
If you tried to describe what God is like, it could be difficult or daunting. But when the people who wrote the Bible pondered the mystery of God, they consistently described God's character in this way. Compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, overflowing with loyal love and faithfulness. We're going to look at this last characteristic of God. It's the Hebrew word emet, which can be translated as faithfulness or even truth. It's related to another word you've probably heard before, amen, which is an untranslated Hebrew expression meaning that's truth. So, emet can mean truth, and it can refer to correct ideas or concepts. This is because emet has to do with stability and reliability, like when Moses holds up his hands for hours to defeat Israel's enemies, the Amalekites. His friends put a rock under him and support his hands so that his hands will remain emet, or steady. When emet is used of people, it describes reliable and stable character, or trustworthiness. Like when Moses appoints leaders in Israel, they're to be people of emet, people who are trustworthy, who won't take bribes or distort justice. So to say that God is full of emet doesn't just mean that God tells the truth or stands for truth. It means that God is faithful and trustworthy. This is why Moses calls God a rock, saying that he's faithful, just, and upright. He's saying that he can trust God to be consistent to his character. And the Hebrew word for trust is actually the verb form of the word emet. It's he'emin. It can be translated as to believe or to have faith, but most basically it means to consider someone trustworthy or to trust. The first person we meet in the Bible who considers God to be trustworthy is Abraham. God makes a promise that Abraham and his wife Sarah will have a huge family and that through them, all nations will experience God's blessing. But Abraham and Sarah are really, really old and they've never been able to have any children. And yet in the face of these challenges, Abraham means God. He considers God trustworthy to open a way forward. And God does show Emet to Abraham and Sarah. In just four generations, their descendants form a whole nation called Israel. And God invites Israel into a trusting and faithful relationship. And when God leads them out of slavery in Egypt, Israel means in God. They trust and rely on him. But when they come to the land God promised to Abraham and they find out it's filled with giant cities protected by giants, their trust in God's Emet fails. But eventually we meet an Israelite who does trust God in the face of giants. It's David. He yells at the giant, you come with a sword and a spear, but I come with the name of the God of Israel. David consistently relies on God. In fact, it said that David walked in and met before God. So David considers God to be faithful and responds with faithfulness. This is why God promises to raise up a faithful descendant of David, whose kingdom will endure forever, or in Hebrew, have emet. This faithful king will become the source of trust and stability for others forever. But when the kingdom later collapses, the Israelites find themselves without a home and without a king. And they cry out, Oh God, where is your loyal love that you swore to David in your emet? They're accusing God of abandoning his promises to Abraham and to David. Is God trustworthy? Is he faithful after all? The first line of the New Testament is an answer to that question. This is the lineage of Jesus the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. In other words, through Jesus, God fulfills his promises. Or as Paul says, Jesus came on behalf of God's faithfulness. He is the faithful king whose kingdom will endure forever and who invites all nations to trust God. Now, trusting anyone is risky. It's hard to know if anyone is really full of emet. But the biblical story portrays a God who's been faithful all along and whose promises were fulfilled in the story of Jesus. And so as we look out at the obstacles facing us and our world, we're invited to take that same risk and join Abraham, David, and the people of God in trusting that God is overflowing with faithfulness. Our lesson this morning is taken from the book of Genesis, chapter 17, verses 1 through 7 and 15 through 16. 
Please listen to the introduction to our lesson. The legend of Abrams and Sarah's names being changed to Abraham and Sarah has little meaning apart from God's covenant promise, which went with it. All subsequent history of the Jewish people rests on this prom promise. They were to be God's people. This particular story was part of a document written by a school of priests that forms the framework for the whole book of Genesis. At least two earlier documents designated the Yahwist and Eloheist from the names for God used therein were fitted into this framework to create the present text. This editorial work was done in the fifth century BC long after Israel's return from exile in Babylon and more than a thousand years after the presumed date of Abraham's migration. Please listen now to the word for God's people. When, Abraham, when Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am God Almighty, walk before me and be blameless, blameless, and I will make my covenant between me and you and will make you exceedingly numerous. Then Abram fell on his face and God said to him, as for me, this is my covenant with you. You shall be the ancestor of a multitude of nations. No longer shall your name be Abram, but your name shall be Abraham. For I have made you the ancestor of a multitude of nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful and I will make nations of you and kings shall come for, from you. I will establish my covenant between me and you and your offspring after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your offspring after you. God said to Abraham, as for Sarai, your wife, you shall not call her Sarai, but Sarah shall be her name. I will bless her, and moreover, I will give you a son by her. I will bless her, and she shall give rise to nations. Kings of peoples shall come from her. May God grant us blessing through the reading and hearing of God's word. Our gospel lesson comes from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 8, verses 27 through 38. Jesus taught his disciples about his impending death, but Peter rebuked him. He still didn't understand the kind of Messiah that Jesus had chosen to be, nor did he understand Christ's demonstration of steadfast faithfulness to God's plan. Mark's narrative goes on to quote Jesus instructing not only the disciples, but the crowd as well about the cost of discipleship. They must follow him all the way to the cross and beyond. By saying so, Jesus made it clear that he was a different kind of savior than his fellow Jews expected. Listen now to the word for God's people. Jesus went on with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi. And on the way, he asked his disciples, who do people say that I am? And they answered him, John the Baptist, and others, Elijah, and still others, one of the prophets. He asked them, but who do you say that I am? And Peter answered him, you are the Messiah. And Jesus sternly ordered them not to tell anyone about him. Then he began to teach them that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering 
and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. He said all this quite openly and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and looking at his disciples, Jesus rebuked Peter and said, get behind me, Satan, for you are setting your mind on divine things, not not on divine things, but on human things. He called the crowd with his disciples and said to them, if any of you want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it. And those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. For what will it profit them to gain the whole world and forfeit their life? Indeed, what can they give in return for their life? Those who are ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation of them, the Son of Man will also be ashamed when he comes into the glory of his Father with the holy angels. This is the word for God's people. May God bless all who hear it, who keep it, and who share it. Let's pray, shall we? Lord, bring us with you on your journey this morning so that we may have the courage to pick up our crosses and follow you. Amen. Whenever I preach on a passage that mentions Satan, I get a little uneasy. And this morning, we have another scripture like that. You see, I didn't grow up in a fundamentalist church, but I grew up in an area filled with them. So what was said in their pulpits sort of spilled out into the rest of the community. Some of my classmates went to churches that preached hellfire and brimstone. They were scared straight into their faith by talk of a literal devil who wanted to burn them for all eternity. But that's not the sort of God or the sort of church that we serve. I don't want to scare people into faith. I want to focus on loving God because God first loves us. Not by telling people that they should love God or else. So when I see a passage like this one from Mark, I'm tempted just to avoid it altogether, or at least the part about Satan and focus on something else. But it's hard to talk around in this particular case. Jesus, you see, is with one of his favorite disciples, and he starts to explain what's about to happen. Jesus knows he's going to be turned over to the authorities, that he'll suffer and be killed, and then that he's going to rise again. But Peter, understandably, gets upset hearing this. He's left everything behind to follow this man, and now he's finding out that his friend is going to die. Maybe he's also realizing that Jesus is, if Jesus is going to be killed, that his own future isn't looking too bright either. He's so afraid, in fact, that he takes Jesus aside and he begins to tell him to stop saying this stuff, to stop talking about death and destruction. And look, Jesus doesn't just disagree with him. He yells at him. He says, get behind me, Satan. You, you got to feel bad, though, for Peter, don't you? He's scared. And he wants to know that it will all turn out to be okay. Jesus not only doesn't listen to him, he calls him one of the worst names he can think of. And it, it just doesn't seem fair. You tell the Lord you don't want him to die, and he responds by calling you Satan. But look closer and another meaning comes out. Remember from last week, the Bible project told us the Hebrew equivalent of the word Jesus calls Peter is hasatan, which doesn't mean devil at all. It's not even a proper name, really. 
It simply means the accuser or the adversary. Jesus isn't saying that Peter is evil incarnate. Peter is being an adversary. He's standing between Jesus and God's plan. So Jesus says, get behind me. Put your protests aside and get in line. Don't oppose me. I have to do this. Peter asks Jesus to compromise what he knows that God has called him to do. And Jesus says, no. In that moment, Jesus tells Peter all he needs to know, you see. It's not going to be easy. And this is not going to end well. And if Peter's going to stand between Christ and the cross, then he's an adversary. The question for Peter now is whether he's ready to walk with Jesus or not. And Jesus goes on to tell him about the life God has called him to. If you want to be my follower, he says you have to take up your cross and follow me. Jesus is inviting Peter to either be a disciple or to get out of the way. Almost all of us know what it's like to have an adversary that keeps us from truly being a disciple, don't we? It might be an actual person. But more likely, your adversary is whatever is standing between you and taking up your cross. It's whatever is keeping you from doing the things God has created you for and has called you to do. We call our adversaries by different names, maybe not devil or Satan. We call them doubt or fear, or pride, addiction. Hatred, anger, greed, insecurity, and millions of others. They might not be the devil we hear about from our fundamentalist colleagues, but they have just as much potential to stand between you and God's plan. And they can be crafty. One young professional I talked to several years ago spoke about how she felt called to devote her life to mission work. Yet, she was afraid to do so because she'd become accustomed to a certain standard of life and feared leaving it. So she never did enter the mission field. A minister I know from another denomination told me that she felt God was asking her to stand up for a particularly unpopular cause in her area. But she couldn't work up the courage because she was afraid it would result in her congregation letting her go. She told me, I believe in dying for a cause, just not quite this young. And look, I, I don't tell these stories as examples of awful people. I tell them because they're a lot like us. We've been there. We've had adversaries keep us from taking up our own cross and being disciples. We know how hard it can be. And we know that when the, we let the adversaries win, we, when we choose safety or our comfort or our own gain over the path that God has set out for us, we rarely find true life. Sure, we might get the money, or the promotion, or the popularity, or the knowledge that our job is safe. But do we lose our soul? How much more would we have gained if we had said instead, get behind me, Satan? But Peter, in his own bumbling, bumbling way, does stop being the adversary. He eventually gets behind Jesus. And he takes up his own cross and follows Jesus. And in the end, he loses the life he knew, only to gain a new kind of life. That's what discipleship's about. It's about being faithful to the, God, the person God has called you to be in every arena of your life. Not just when things are easy, but every single day. And Lent, you're called to tell the adversary whatever 
the adversary happens to be to get behind you so that you can raise up. I'd like to close with a poem by British writer and actor Adrian Plass entitled, When I Became a Christian. When I became a Christian, I said, Lord, now fill me in. Tell me what I'll suffer in this world of shame and sin. He said, your body may be killed and left to rot and stink. Do you still want to follow me? I said, amen. I think. I think amen. Amen, I think. I think I say amen. I'm not completely sure. Can you just run through that again? You say my body might be killed and left to rot and stink? Well, yes, that sounds terrific, Lord. I say amen. I think. But Lord, there must be other ways to follow you, I said. I really would prefer to end up dying in my bed. Well, yes, he said. You could put up with sneers and scorn and spit. Do you still want to follow me? I said, amen. A bit. A bit, amen. Amen. A bit. A bit, I say, amen. I'm not entirely sure. Can we just run through that again? You said I could put up with sneers and also scorn and spit? Well, yes, I've made my mind up and I say, amen. A bit. Well, I sat back and thought a while and tried a different ploy. I said, now, Lord, the good book says that Christians live in joy. That's true, he said. You need the joy to bear the pain and sorrow. So do you want to follow me? I said, amen. Tomorrow. Tomorrow, Lord. I'll say it then. That's when I'll say amen. I need to get it clear. Can I just run through that again? You say that I will need the joy to bear the pain and sorrow. Well, yes, I think I've got it straight. I'll say amen tomorrow. He said, look, I'm not asking you to spend an hour with me, a quick salvation sandwich or a cup of sanctity. The cost is you, not half of you, but every single bit. Now tell me, will you follow me? I said, amen. I quit. I'm very sorry, Lord, I said. I'd like to follow you, but I don't think religion is the manly thing to do. He said, forget religion then and think about my son and tell me if you're man enough to do what he has done. Are you man enough to see the need and man enough to go? Man enough to care for those who no one wants to know? Man enough to say the thing that people hate to hear, to battle through Gethsemane and loneliness and fear. And listen, are you man enough to stand it at the end? The moment of betrayal by the kisses of a friend? Are you man enough to hold your tongue and man enough to cry? When and when nails break your body, are you man enough to die? Man enough to take the pain and wear it like a crown? Man enough to love the world and turn it upside down? Are you man enough to follow me? I asked you once again. I said, oh Lord, I'm frightened. But I also said, amen. 
Amen, 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 amen. Amen, amen, amen. I said, oh Lord, I'm frightened. But I also said, amen. Please join me in singing our hymn of faith, the summons. Without talking back, without asking questions, let us move into God's love. Let us go with God to offer our gifts. Let us give God our thanks in our tithes, tithes and offerings. Please remember the church with your tithes and offerings. pray shall we you stop us in our tracks father with your reminder that discipleship is not a sometimes thing we're called to place our whole lives in your care to follow you to serve you by caring for others not just once in a while but all the time and we admit we're not always ready to do this. The demand is great right now and the need is great and our energies are limited. But we do our best, Lord, to follow you, to hear your voice and to take up our crosses. Today, we lift up those in need of our care in yours. We lift up before you People of Texas, family of Rush Limbaugh, residents without heat and Menwa apartments, 
Diane Hadala. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Reggie, Bud and Anita, Karen and John, Robin and Bob. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lynette, Perrin and family, Lauren, Lisa and Jerry, Sujanta. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Billy, Jan, Terry, Diane. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And Chris, Teresa, family of Dr. Kennard Ford, and Matt and Dan Delnoch. Del Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Faithful God, help us to place our trust and our lives in your care, knowing that you will give us the strength and courage that we need for this step on the journey. Be with us, Lord. Help us to remember that your love is poured out for all your people. You are faithful and never far, far away. You walk with us each and every step. We ask all of this in the name of the one we call Jesus, the Messiah, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. I invite you now to join me in our closing uh, verse of the summons. The step of discipleship requires commitment and faithfulness. Go now in peace, bringing the good news of Jesus' love to all people. Do not be afraid. God is with you every step of the way. Amen. <laughs>